Think about this for a minute. If you had the choice to have a baby that you designed that had all the traits you want, let's say you wanted blue eyes and athletic and a certain color of hair, would you use science to design your own baby? Well, in this video, that's what we're going to talk about. The idea of changing the human genome to favor certain traits. Let's get started. So before we can really talk about how we could design babies with certain traits, we first need to be reminded of a little biology. A little biology that will tell us how we inherit certain traits to begin with. So what you may remember is that our traits are caused by proteins, right? So if I have brown hair, or maybe it's a little gray now, um, brown eyes, that's because I have certain proteins that reflect those colors of light. Same thing for my height or my intelligence. Believe it or not, a lot of that goes back to the genes that code for the proteins that either make up my hair or my brain or whatever. So our traits are caused by genes that code for certain polypeptides, which together make proteins. And then those proteins give us our phenotypic characteristics, right? What we think of as a trait. So just a little diagram to remind you of that. Our genes are in our DNA. That DNA is transcribed into RNA, which then makes the protein. The protein down here is what makes certain traits. So in essence, if I changed our or my DNA, if I changed the gene, I could essentially change the protein and change the trait. So let's get into this. This field of study um, is known as eugenics. And there's a long dark history of eugenics in our country and in the world. But basically what eugenics means is, it's from the Greek meaning good genes. So if someone believes in eugenics, they believe that there is benefit to increasing the quality of the human genome. And that would be artificially, right? So evolution through natural selection has been changing the human genome over time. But this would be a deliberate e effort by humans to artificially change our genomes. So I wanna to talk to you about how that's been done. So we have a pretty dark past of this, right? We know in Sparta, there were some selections for certain traits through infanticide, meaning the babies that were born that didn't have these traits, well, they were killed. We also know that in Rome, um, there are some instances of deformed children being put to death, right? If they didn't have good genes, so to speak, they would be put to death. Um, and then a little later, or a little more modern actually, Sir Francis Galton was one of the first philosophers that really preached this idea of only people with good genes, those genes we find favorable, should be allowed, allowed to reproduce. So unless you had good genes under his um, philosophy, you wouldn't be able to have a baby. Um, and um, of course, we all know about um, Nazi Germany's attempt at, or not just attempt, but uh, belief in forced sterilization. So meaning that they would force different groups of people they didn't deem worthy to be sterilized so that they could not have a baby or not have children. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about some things that happened in history. So there was this idea, as I mentioned with Sir Francis Galton, of superior mating. Only people with good genes were allowed to produce children in some places. Um, it's interesting that even though this is sort of a historical idea, if you go online, if you're wanting to do some online dating, I found two, not because I was looking, but um, I found two um, interesting dating sites that analyze your DNA and they say, oh, this would be a perfect mate or partner 
for you and they base it on your DNA. Um, I, it's probably a lot of pseudoscience going on there, but anyway, that does exist today. Um, then, of course, I mentioned the Romans who would abandon or kill to form children. Um, there's another idea throughout history of weak people, weaker people with bad genes, right, whatever that means, um, letting them not survive as well as everyone else. Don't spend resources on people who are weak or can't be contributing members of society. Um, and then forced sterilization. We mentioned that as well, whether that would be um, surgically removing um, anatomical parts that allow people to reproduce or chemical sterilization of people with bad genes, um, whatever bad genes means. Um, another thing that history has done repeatedly is try to keep certain groups out, right, through immigration control. We don't want this group in. We don't want this group because their genes are bad or whatever. Um, and obviously, I think most modern humans would agree we have had a really dark history of doing a lot of this stuff, right? Um, it's, it seems immoral. It seems like how could we, how could we be doing this to people, right? But it, but it is in our history. So let's, let's go a step further now. And let's really talk about when eugenics really got nasty, right? Genocide. Throughout our history, there have been groups of people that killed other groups of people because they thought they were inferior, right? So pretty dark history we've had. And um, although I think we've come a long way, um, there's still some interesting things out there for you to sort of ethically consider, and we'll, we'll talk about those as we move through. All right, so what about today and tomorrow? What are we going to be able to do? All right, well, one interesting thing, right, I'm sort of making a shift now to um, a different sort of technology-based or biotechnology-based um, system of sort of designing babies. So... What do we do? Well, right now we actually can do what we call prenatal testing. So prenatal testing would be um, you look at several different groups of maybe embryos that you might have implanted. If you find some that have some serious illnesses, you abort those and only implant certain ones, okay? Again, I'm not gonna tell you how to feel about a lot of this. I'm just gonna give you some information. Um, another is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. I'm going to go over that in more detail. But basically, we only implant or we pre-implant the babies with the good genes that we want. Transgenic transfer. That's actually um, some modern science where we can actually put in certain genes into an embryo. I'll show you that one. And then the most interesting that's uh, popped up recently is gene editing with CRISPR-Cas9. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the science of these and tell you sort of the mechanisms of them, and then we'll sort of end with maybe some thoughts about the ethics of all this. So pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. This is basically when you choose the embryo with the traits that you want to implant. How does this work? All right. So we do in vitro fertilization. So we do this outside of the body. In vitro sort of means in a test tube, right? So we take a sperm from a donor, we take an egg from a donor, they combine. We then take the embryo cultures that have gone from those and we do a little biopsy, right? We take a little bit of that tissue out and we test it. Um, and one of the things we're looking and the ways that we're testing is we can do it through PCR, polymerase chain reaction, or another way of actually doing some cell screening called the FISH method that actually looks at the genes and based on what we know about DNA will tell us if this baby will have certain traits. Will it have this disease? Will it um, have this color of hair? I guess we could go as far as to look. And then what you would then do is pick the one you wanted, right? If you didn't want this one because, you know, it didn't have the right hair or if it was going to have some disease, you wouldn't put that one in, but instead you'd implant, right, into the cervix of a woman the desired, or you would transfer, it has to do its own implantation, but you would transfer that desired embryo into the cervix, okay? So that is one way of essentially choosing the baby you might want to have. Another way is transgenic transfer. 
So this is where we insert a transgene, meaning a gene from some other source, into a fertilized egg. And the benefit of this, biologically speaking, right, not ethically speaking, the benefit is that if we change an embryo or fertilized egg when it's one cell, then all resulting cells that come from that and turn into a baby or a human would have the changed gene in it. So what you would do, and this is just using mice, we've definitely done this a lot in mice. Ethically, I think there's still a question about doing this in humans, but we take a super ovulated female. So this is a female, we take many eggs out, and then we put some sperm, right, from another mouse, we let fertilization occur. Then we take the fertilized egg, hold it in place, where all this, by the way, is done under a microscope. And then we take a transgene, a gene from something else. Um, maybe we take it from a jellyfish that glows in the dark. Maybe we take it from this other animal or plant that's got this certain property. And we take that gene and then we put it into the male pronucleus, right? That part of the sperm that has the DNA. So that becomes fertilized. Then you take that transgenic zygote, put it back into the reproductive system of the female mouse. And then of course she has, um, that female mouse becomes pregnant, delivers the baby, and we have a, a transgenic mouse. We've done this a lot with mice changing their genes. One of the coolest ones is to take that glow in the dark, that pea glow plasmid from a jellyfish and put it in here so that the, the mice actually glow in the dark. We're doing this with some insects, inserting certain genes to change some of the diseases they carry. So the question then becomes, well, is this something we want to do in humans, right? Is it, is it ethical to start inserting genes into potential children? So one of the most interesting new uh, biological or biotech tools that we have is CRISPR-Cas9. And this is basically a gene editing tool for living organisms. Now why this is important is because this is one of the first tools that lets us edit something in a live organism. Those others, if you remember, it had to all be sort of before life took place. Um, and CRISPR-Cas9, CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Now that's a, that's a mouthful. But if you break it down, clustered just means sort of clumped together. Regularly interspaced, they're spaced in a regular fashion. So a short palindromic repeat means that there's these series of palindromes. If you think of race car, that's a palindrome, meaning forwards and backwards, race car race car. So if you think of our genetic language, right, the language of nucleotides, if you had A, T, C, G, C, T, A, that's a palindrome. This way and this way, it's, it's the same. So this CRISPR happens to have these palindromic repeats in its code. Well, what does it actually do? All right, so here is an example of CRISPR-Cas9. This little thing right here is the CRISPR part, and it's got these single-guided RNAs. What it's doing is we manufacture, basically, a segment of RNA linked here, and it goes to find a certain gene. So if we knew the sequence of a gene, let's say it was A, T, C, C, G, G, A, we'd manufacture this RNA with the complementary sequence so that would go throughout the genome, find that particular gene, and then it's linked with this Cas9 enzyme protein. Cas9 was actually, actually evolved by some bacteria to cut up foreign DNA because these bacteriophages were coming and they were... Um, inserting this harmful viral DNA into bacteria, and bacteria are like, no thank you. So they evolved an ability, this protein, to cut up foreign DNA. So basically what this is doing is this CRISPR-Cas9 system looks for a gene, cuts it, and then allows a few things to happen, right? There's two options here. One, we call a non-homologous end joining, meaning once we do the cut, there's now an error in the DNA and so if it tries to repair itself, it'll still probably be error prone. We would do this 
to turn off a gene, right? So if you had some gene that was causing you some illness or something, we could actually go in, perform this CRISPR-Cas9 in some of your cells, and this gene would be disrupted. And if the DNA, the gene is bad, remember, the protein or your phenotype that's linked to that would all be bad. Another option, which I think is a little more interesting, is a homology-directed repair. So what you would do is you'd make the cut, and then you'd also put in some small little templates of DNA that where the ends matched up here perfectly so that the DNA itself inserted into your DNA. So this is a way of actually inserting a gene into your DNA or correcting perhaps a bad gene that you had. Okay, so really cool, amazing new biotechnology tool that we're using. What can you do with this? Well, obviously there's some medical applications. We could correct genetic disorders by either introducing or removing that gene. Things like hemophilia, cystic fibrosis, right? Some really bad things um, that are genetic in, in um, their origin, right? Now it's going to be hard, like if you catch a, a virus or uh, you catch a bacteria, right? That's a different thing. Right? That's something you caught that's invaded your system. But if you have a genetic disorder, something from birth, like cystic fibrosis, thalassemia, hemophilia, going in and changing those genes would lead you to not have that disease anymore. Um, CRISPR-Cas9 could also help in drug development, right? So we could go in and make targeted potential drugs to um, go in and specifically address some of these issues. Um, in biology, one of the interesting things that we do is we could genetically engineer animals, right? So we've been doing this for years and years in terms of um, selection of animals, right? If you look at modern day turkeys or chickens, they are horribly deformed from what they used to be because we have customized or hybridized them to get right the most meat out of them or to get them to taste a certain way. But this would be doing it genetically. So we could improve livestock um, and actually in living animals with problems, maybe change in vivo, that means in life, in the living model, actually genetically engineer um, them to be different. Um, some more applications in biotech, of course, we could genetically engineer um, some algae to reproduce more lipids so that they make better biofuels, right? Instead of digging out all of these um, particular fossil fuels from the earth and burning them, we can make biofuels that might be a little better for our planet um, and that were just made from algae. So it would be a renewable resource. And then of course we could do the same thing with plants that we would do with animals, right? Change the plants, give them different genetically modified traits that allow them to be more shelf, uh, shelf have better shelf life or be resistant to certain diseases, okay? So lots of options for the future. Okay, it all comes back then to this, this to me, one of the most fascinating things to talk about, designer babies. So if we can alter and if we can design a baby to be whatever we think is the designer choice, right? Should we be doing it? Well, before we get into that topic, let me just throw out two ideas. One, are we there yet? Uh, not necessarily. One reason is the science just isn't there yet because we know most traits, even like hair color and eye color, are, com are polygenic, meaning they're very complex. It's not just one gene that affects it. If it was one gene that affected my eye color or whatever, we could go in and easily change that, but it's not. It's multiple genes. And when you get into something like intelligence or athletic ability, designing the perfect, brilliant baby that could also, you know, do amazing sports ball games, well, that is so complex, we don't even know all the genes linked to those traits yet, okay? So the science isn't quite there yet. Will it get there? I'm sure. I'm confident it will. Um, but it's, it's certainly not there yet. Um, and then the other, th the other thing we're going to come in, uh, into an issue with is regulations, right? Science is ahead of our government in terms of regulating this stuff yet. 
can we do these things? Can we design babies? Can we implant certain ones that we want and not, right? Um, laws and regulations are still in place in some places um, to prevent some of this. So um, this image is actually three different, uh, the cover of three different magazines pretty recently, all talking about this. Is eugenics back, right? Taking and making the perfect baby. Um, how can we engineer the human race? Is that something we want to do? The Economist, editing humanity, right? Giving them perfect pitch so they can hear. Oh, they got fast legs, so they're a good sprinter. Perfect 2020 vision, very high IQ. We want that. Oh, and we can't have a bald baby. So this is a topic people are thinking about. Okay, so let's talk ethics. I think most of us or most modern humans would agree that we have a very dark past of this. We've been... We've prejudged a lot of people. We've favored some traits over others, and we've just done a lot of harm. So I think most of us would agree that the history of eugenics is bad and dark. But what about the future? What about if the eugenics is done by choice? If you want to do it to yourself or if you want to do it to your baby, where's the line? So from here on out, I'm just going to ask some questions. I'm going to give you some ethical considerations without really trying to make any judgments. I'm going to let you decide for yourself what you think is right. Um, what about choice? So think about separating this into some ideas. Is it okay to genetically alter someone through CRISPR or whatever to take out a disease that they might have had, right? So... What if, for example, someone you, a baby we knew was going to be born with asthma? Is that something we're going to take out? We're going to change that gene so that baby isn't born with asthma. What if they're going to be born with Down syndrome? Is that something that you would change, right? Is there a difference then in diseases and is there a scale, right? Who decides what disease is bad enough? right? It's Down syndrome. Is that even a disease? It's actually a chromosomal change. Um, is, is some baby born with some particular trait? Who decides what can actually be changed? And then how far do we go? Um, if someone was going to be born with Tay-Sachs disease, for example, a horrible disease that affects the lipid breakdown in the brain and where most of the babies die by five. Is it okay to change that gene? But then what if someone comes along and says, oh, you know, I've got OCD or I've got depression. I don't want, you know, I'm predisposed to have depression or alcoholism. I want to change those genes so that my baby isn't predisposed to have depression or alcoholism. And then what about cosmetic? Okay, well, in my family, we've got misshapen noses, let's say. Is it okay to start doing cosmetic enhancement? We want our baby to have blue eyes, or we want them to have brown eyes. We want them to have dark hair. We want them to have light hair. Where is the line? Disease? Cosmetic? Do we let humans do what they want? The science is going to catch up with us, so we need to start thinking about some of these ethical considerations now. Do you want to design your perfect baby? All right, so I'll end with a few thoughts. What does this do to diversity? This whole idea about ethics and our morals, you know, we'll put that aside for a minute, but I want you to think about diversity. We know biologically diversity is good for our species, right? We know in every species on our planet, the more diverse it is, the more likely it is to survive, right? So if you think about um animals that are really struggling, right? You looked at the cheetah population where there's a bottleneck and a lot of these cheetahs were actually almost identical. Well, it's hard for them then to combat different diseases if all of the cheetahs are exactly the same, right? Um, so what does choosing our own genes do to diversity? Um, and another, you know, interesting point to consider, and I've mentioned it all along, is who makes these decisions? Do you make it? Does the government make it? 
who gets to make the decision and take it even further, does a child get to make a decision for themselves? Is it an adult? Well, what about an adult making a decision for a baby that's not been born? Okay, lots of really interesting things to consider. So I'm gonna leave you with one thought um, that I, I asked my class one time and they, they found it really interesting. I want you to think right now, just make a decision for yourself. If you could have a designer baby, would you do it? Would you go ahead, pick out the traits you wanted, implant those, have that exact baby you wanted? Would you do it? If your answer is no, I want to have you think about this. If you wouldn't choose to make a designer perfect baby, then don't get upset when your baby isn't perfect. Okay? Think about all that. I hope you really give some of this some really good thought.